Hello and welcome to this blog post. I'm voiceover artist and actor Rebecca McKernan and today I'll be sharing with you the latest offering from the wonderful Martin Schiller. This is book four in his Our Man Adelaide series and it's titled Our Man Adelaide The Sleeping Land. So this series, if you're not familiar with it, uh, centres around a sort of Avengers-esque heroine, Adelaide de Marcy, and it, the story is told um, uh, from her recounting as an old woman her adventures as a younger woman. Uh, book four centres around her adventures through Jap Japan. Yeah, <laughs> I was getting Japan's and Jamaica's mixed up then. Japan, <laughs> maybe Jamaica's book five, who knows? Japan and Russia. Uh, I'll read to you the back of the book. The Great War is over, but the world is not at peace. Off in the east, the Russian Revolution rages, and the great powers, including Imperial Japan, are struggling to contain the threat of Bolshevism. <laughs> Bolshevism. Meanwhile, hundreds of tons of gold have been looted from the Imperial Treasury, and whoever controls this vast wealth wins the revolution. It is in this tumultuous setting that Adelaide de Marcy finds herself dispatched to Japan and then Siberia. There, <clears throat> there she will discover something far more valuable than gold and contend with forces that are infinitely more dangerous than mere partisans or bandits. Martin's books are always really beautifully produced as well uh, by actually his own publishing company. Uh, you know, just saying, <laughs> who doesn't have their own publishing company? I don't. <laughs> so I'm going to read to you the first few pages. What shall I read? I'm going to read actually not the prologue. I'm going to start in chapter one. Uh, just a few pages of chapter one for you. Um, I feel like I need to put a disclaimer out because I can't remember which, uh, which accents are included in the first few pages. Now with my uh, fully edited audiobooks, I can edit out any sort of dreadful accents and re-record them slightly less dreadfully. But this is, well, for all intents and purposes, live because I'm not going to edit it. So uh, yeah, sorry if you get some bad Russian or bad Japanese out of me. That's why. No editing. Chapter one, Faux Paris, London, oh, that's safe, United Kingdom, 15 November 1918. Only five days after the armistice, Adelaide and her companions received a summons from C, instructing them to meet with him as soon as possible. Although it was quite late in the afternoon when they received the message, they packed their bags, boarded Sir Thomas's motor car, and left the Blackthorn Estate for London. By the time that they arrived, it was just after eight in the evening, and being as well acquainted with his work habits as they were, they made for his private residence, rather than wasting their time with a visit to his office. He was, of course, expecting them, and as was his wont, he had taken the time to dress himself for the occasion. Thus, when they were shown into his study, they found him attired in the robes of Pax, the Roman goddess of peace. Monocle notwithstanding, Adelaide thought that his costume was quite convincing. She also took note of the electric slide projector sitting atop his desk, along with a locked metal box that had been enticingly labelled Top Secret. Well, said, C said, arranging his stola to best effect, I must apologise for the melodramatic nature of my message, but something of great importance has arisen. Sir Thomas waved this away. No apologies are needed, sir. Please tell us what has transpired. Our embassy in Paris was recently contacted by a very remarkable young woman, the spymaster revealed, and she told us a rather shocking tale. Indeed, Sir Thomas asked, leaning forwards in his chair. His companions did the same, for C was excuse me, for C was seldom shocked by anything. Yes, his superior confirmed, producing a key and opening the metal box, it proved to contain a series of glass slides. Saying no more, he then switched the projector on and arranged it so that its light fell squarely on an empty portion of the study's wall. Mr Bartrand, you are closest to the switch. Could you turn off the lights, please? When Bertrand obliged him, C loaded the first slide. It displayed Tsar Nicholas II of Russia and his family, sitting for an official photograph. In addition to the monarch, there was the Tsarina, his four daughters and his son. 
Betsy replaced it with another image, and Adelaide recognised the figure from the family portrait. She was an attractive young woman, with high cheekbones and a slim figure, and the gown that she wore was elegant. Over all, she exuded a regal aura that immediately marked her out as the daughter of an emperor. This is Tatiana Nikolaevna. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just making sure that I pronounce this right. I probably won't. Uh, <laughs> this is Tatiana Nikol... <laughs> Nikolaevna Romanova, Grand Duchess of Russia, and the daughter of the late Tsar Nicholas II, C explained. He then removed the slide and inserted another. It showed what looked like the same woman, but dressed in much simpler clothes and wearing a haggard expression. And this is the woman who came to our embassy. She claimed to be none other than the Grand Duchess herself, and asked us for our immediate assistance, stating that she had fled Russia and that the Cheka the Bolshevik secret police were hard on her heels. I read that the Tsar's family were all in protective custody somewhere, Sir Thomas remarked. Adelaide had been under the same impression. According to the newspapers, the Tsar had been executed by the Bolsheviks on the 17th of July, but on the 27th, the general public had been assured that his family was safe and lodged at a Siberian monastery. That is also what the rest of the world believes, C disclosed. Yet, according to what this woman told our ambassador, it is actually a lie of the darkest sort. Sir Thomas took this in and asked, I see, and how do we know that she is not the liar? Perhaps she is a fraud. A reasonable question, C conceded. Firstly, there is the resemblance, which as you can see is uncanny. Secondly, she was able to supply us with some details about the former Tsar and King George that only a member of the Romanov family would be privy to. Unfortunately, I cannot share the specifics with you, as they would prove to be a rather as they would prove to be rather embarrassing to his majesty, but rest assured that they are of such a nature as to be incontrovertible. Thirdly, we have independent confirmation, not only of her identity, but also of her tale. This comes to us from a high-level asset who occupies a key position within the Bolshevik leadership. Again, I cannot share any further information than this. Were their involvement with us to become known, it would cost them their very lives. And why is she in Paris, sir? Sir Thomas inquired. For that matter, why is she being pursued by the Cheka at all? There are many high-level Russian expatriates living in Europe just now, and none of them are facing this sort of danger. Before I can answer that, C replied, I must insist that everything I tell you from here on remains between us and us alone. That includes you, Mr. Bertrand. I do not intend any insult by this, but what I have to disclose is not something that you can share in the confessional and with some random parish priest. Bertrand's eyebrows shot up and his eyes cut to Sir Thomas in suspicion. No, Mr. Bertrand, C said, guessing the reason. Sir Thomas did not betray your confidence. The Bureau learned all about your past well before we made you an offer of employment. Your record with the Metropolitan Police, along with your army records, supplied the majority of it. As for your recent return to the church, we learned about that while you were in hospital over in Belgium. And again, you were not betrayed. Father Campbell scrupulously maintained the sanctity of your confession. It was in fact your orderly who alerted us, and then only by accident. By accident? Bertrand asked. Yes, he mentioned the priest's visit in passing to a nurse, who simply updated your records, and we in turn received a copy. As you might recall, you never did specify your faith when you joined the army. Now that omission has been rectified, and the service is all the wiser. I see. Now, as to making a confession, I appreciate the demands of your religion, and if you feel that you must seek absolution, you are free to do so, but with one condition. And that is? That when you do, that you speak with one of our fellows. Our fellows? Yes, we just so happen to have several priests working with the Bureau, for the Bureau, who are clear to minister to those of us serving in intelligence. I assure you that they are all men of God, but they also appreciate the need to maintain national security. I see. Well then, I suppose that that will have to do, Bertrand agreed. You have my silence then, and my word. Good, he smiled and it will also please you to learn that one such fellow is none other than the same Father Campbell that you spoke with in Belgium. Having served his majesty, he has recently separated from the army and returned from the continent. 
Based upon your previous interaction, I am quite certain that you two will get along famously. I, ah, uh, thank you, sir, Bertrand stammered, not a little stunned by this revelation. You are quite welcome, C returned. I would also have you know that before he pursued the vocation of a priest, that he distinguished himself as an agent. If anyone can understand what you are forced to deal with, it is he. He did? Yes, and that is precisely why he was stationed at Popperinga. His, message, his mission there was to provide spiritual comfort to those members of the service battalion that required it, such as yourself. Bertrand awarded him a jaundiced smile. You don't miss a trick, do you? We try not to, C replied, and then his expression hardened. Now, to the heart of the matter, and some very unpleasant truths. While everyone knows that the Tsar met his end at the hands of the Reds, what they do not know is that he did not die alone. Well, I got lucky with the accents there. <laughs> I'm going to finish there. So that was the first few pages of, you can see my ring light in there. <laughs> I don't naturally look this glowing, uh, of chapter one of Martin Schiller's book four of the Owlman Adelaide series, The Sleeping Land. Book five is currently uh, not in production as such, but being written. And I can't wait to see where, where in the world we are taken to next, because it's always a bit of a global adventure with Martin. Um, they are sequential, these books. I mean, they can be read as standalone books, but I think you'd miss out on quite a lot of backstory. So start with book one, as sequence normally works. <laughs> um, if you have any questions or you want to reach out, you can find me. Uh, or uh, I'm not going to use my website much more. So um, you can find me on Twitter at Becca Tells Tales, or you can email me at Becca, B-E-C-C-A. Let's try that again. B E C C A tells tales at gmail.com. I'll put my details in the uh, wee box underneath this video. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I look forward to bringing whatever exciting adventure comes to you next <laughs> via these blog, blog posts. You take care, and I'll speak to you again soon. Mwah.